Hello, I am Kalmas from the Jekyll Hyde Club, reviewing the terror of the spirit world under the quest of Curious Cat. And this is a very interesting deck, Terror of the Spirit World. It shows how logic and emotion can work together, basically. Because all the spirits that are present in this deck, there are some supernatural looking entities. All they really mean is that there is subtler influences affecting our decisions. We can see that already in the card of the Fool. Uh, as every typical Fool in the regular deck, I'll show you this one for comparison from the standard tarot deck, Rider Way that you all know and love. Uh, the Fool uh, usually has two modes. It either comes with its own baggage, unaware of all the things that it brings with itself uh, into the future life, or else it chooses to deal with what it brings, it is aware and it is trying to deal however wisely. Usually those are the two modes of operation of the Fool, uh, of either gender the male or the female one, uh, in this case it's usually the male. And in this deck, Terror of the Spirit World, we see that the Fool here is drawn to something, some kind of experimentation, just like the Fool in the traditional deck. And behind the decision there is something, that would be the influence, a presence, something that looks sort of metaphysical, sort of subtle, the coloring scheme is very nice here, and it shows that the decision of the Fool is not independent, the Fool is affected by outer agencies, by something that the Fool cannot see. In a sense, that's how our emotions can be affected by different kind of logic, by higher reasoning, by intuition, by all kinds of factors that we cannot normally feel unless we are tuned to subtler influences. And for that I like that full card very much. And uh, it is inspiring and a good start for this deck. With the Magician we often see that the Magician either works alone or he works sometimes as part of a group but leading the group he's usually in charge and his job is of course to control the elements and here we see from this magician deck that he seemingly is alone but if we look really carefully we see that there is a sort of demonic face over here very cute adorable friendly almost but the magician does not seem to be aware of it on one hand and on the other hand the magician seems his facial expression in some way replicates the joviality of the demon over here which is very interesting and the magician of course is not aware the conclusion from it would be the same in many of the major arcane cards here, that the subtle influence works together with the more tangible influence, they combine, they work, they're incorporated into one another, they work together towards the same goals, and on one level the higher entity is aware of what the lower one is doing, but on the other hand, it doesn't go the other way. The magician is not necessarily aware of what energy he is channeling here, expressed by this infinity loop. And the infinity seems to be colored almost like the color of fire. The magician is usually supposed to be control in control of all the elements. And there are some signs that the magician has other elements at his disposal, which is very interesting. But the fire is the loop itself. and. To a degree that could indicate that his passions are guiding him. It might be towards something nice, but the problem with that uh, could be that the disadvantage that he's not fully aware of what is guiding him, just like the fool. And that, to my mind, is a slight deviation from st some standards, because the fool is usually unaware and reckless, but the magician is usually a little bit more, more in control, and he has his deficiencies that are usually addressed by the high priestess card that follows him, but he doesn't have that specific deficiency of not being aware what is guiding him. So that is a unique touch visually of the terror of the spirit world that I respect. The High Priestess we usually find between two pillars of knowledge, experience, 
And here, the Terror of the Spirit World has this interesting element. There is the duality, but it's of a different nature, and it kind of recurs as a motif throughout the deck in both Major and Minor Arcana. You would see a useful recipient of knowledge with an elder presence guiding them, and it's a mutually beneficial relationship. On a psychological level, it could be likened to how the inner child of a human person and the adult responsible part coexist, where the inner child is recipient to learning all kinds of interesting things and use them and have joy from them, and the adult would know exactly how to make them accomplish, because a concept is one thing and making it true is an entirely different matter. So both actually benefit because the adult gets listened to and the child gets guided. It's a mutual beneficial relationship. And again, to my mind, this is a unique touch of the Terror of the Spirit world, because normally it's the High Priestess who guides outside forces. Here it appears instead that the inner voice is guiding the outer shell, which is very interesting and beautifully done, but also a unique psychological concept. The Empress here is the same. We usually see the Empress controlling something from her throne room uh, in a similar position to the, that of the seated presence over here. Uh, here we see instead the combination, just like in every other major arcane deck, card of this deck, we see that the presence, the solar presence depicted in specifically light colors is always contrasted with the more mundane presence that is done in solid dark colors that could be sort of earthly and you can visually tell them apart and you can tell that they're working together and again one of them is affected by the other and with the Empress it could be the effect of the emotion the emotions are guiding this person over here the emotions that are unfelt their source is unclear their source is located here, but unseen by the one who is experiencing them, and the experience is just as striking despite not being aware of what causing it. It's just as real and just as uh, powerful, and to an extent debilitating. You can see that this presence here of this tangible body is upset, maybe even devastated by whatever it is she's experiencing. So, again, this is not the regular typical representation of the Empress card, and it was a good choice on the part of Curious Cat to select the deck for review, and it is definitely unique. Uh, this is one of my favorite cards, the Emperor. Uh, the Emperor, we usually see him sitting on a throne, and to some degree it can be said that the throne gives him his authority. I already reviewed it in several decks, it's this mythological concept that the throne is the seat of power, it goes back to those kings and their stones as the Earth recognizes its representative, and that's what the throne does for the Emperor usually. But here instead it's beautiful, the king is putting on his own crown, it is his age and experience here that bestows upon him the crown, and he is the source of the power. The relationship here is entirely opposite than that of typical emperors, where they receive their power from the throne here. He, his knowledge, his wisdom is the one guiding the crown. It's really impressive, really striking colors, and a really great concept. Uh, in the Hierophant, we get the first truly supernatural entity, let's call it a grotesque, a gargoyle, maybe, a sort of demonic kind of a presence. Very interesting. Um, in normal Hierophants, we get some element of practical experience guiding them, and they are using it to guide others, often a child or recipient of knowledge who is younger than themselves. It is usually experiential knowledge. Here we see that the situation is slightly different. The Hierophant here himself is the recipient of guidance. And despite the supernatural aspect of the presence that's guiding him here, the subtler presence, uh, it might be, again, in a sense, his inner voice 
the voice of experience, but sometimes, as happens, for example, in the language of dreams, you don't even know, you don't recognize what experience you're actually having, you have a different outlook on it. And that seems to be the case with the Hierophant, he is not entirely clear on what kind of knowledge he is receiving, which is very interesting and I do like the supernatural creature next to him. There are many in this deck, but despite again their supernatural aspect, they don't necessarily mean that they are demons or devils, of course. They're more the inner voices, the ones that are perceived as strange by the regular uh, view of the person himself, who would not recognize that they even belong to them, that he is inspired by them, that they guide him. It's a very interesting, uh, similar in some ways even to the Necronomicon deck that I reviewed earlier because of how similarly unfamiliar, disgusting, repelling for some monsters represent such basic elements of nature that a regular person is not always aware of but just as in need of. So it's very good, good representation of the Hierophant. And now for comparison here are two different lovers cards, one from the regular deck and one from Terror of the Spirit World. And you can see that there are subtle and not so subtle differences either. That for one, the lovers are not usually conjoined, they uh, are standing some distance apart and somebody is presiding over their wedding ceremony similar to the alchemical wedding and Hyros Gamos in mythology. Uh, but here in the regular deck we see the presence that's guiding the ceremony, sort of impartial, standing above, standing apart from the ceremony. And here we see in Terror of the Spirit World again, somebody who is more personally involved. They are deeply touched, as can be seen from the gesture of their hands, by the per ceremony they're performing, they're very involved in it, and the lovers themselves are very much conjoined. We've seen that kind in the Da Vinci deck already, where there is the difference. The lovers usually pursue either uh, two, pa two different parts coming together, or a synthetic approach where two become one, and this is more of the latter, and it is a legitimate touch. Uh, the differences are not great here, but only it reaffirms the general impression of the deck that there is a presence again that is above and it's guiding those lovers in this case. And the presence could represent the drives, the interests that are again could be invisible for a little while until they become visible and then they acquire a material aspect as in the joining of the lovers themselves. Uh, the chariot, perhaps, is more uh, more comparable to the traditional touch. It's one of the most regular cards, because here, even though the chariot is represented as a subtle presence of the familiar chariot of the black and white horse, here uh, the person guided by it is moving, so the chariot often represents balance, of course, and in this case the balance is represented in a pretty standard way through the chariot itself. The chariot concept goes all the way back to Plato, who described the, the dark horse and the other horse, one guiding you towards noble aspirations and the other towards darker impulses, so the chariot has ever since been used in many tarot decks, and this is just one more example. This is the less striking card of this deck, but it is consistent with the Rider Waite system. And then the eighth card is also interesting. We see alterations of this motif of uh, 8 and 11, justice and strength, they're often uh, interchangeable. And in this case, it's the justice again. Uh, the justice is not as straightforward as some other elements of it. Here we see that the choices of this individual making perhaps a judgment might be guided by his past experience represented by somebody hanging down there. So this is not a complete fair justice as we perhaps are used to from the blind justice images on other decks. This is more partial justice, a justice that already made its case, it's going to stick by it. It might try to be impartial, but there is something holding it back, there is experience that makes sure that its decision is going to be more biased and 
less uh, fair than what we're used to which in this case again makes this deck different from many other justice cards uh, the hermit is fairly stereotypical some of the hermit images in medieval representation goes back to Saint Jerome and his hermitage years in the cave, the, one of the fathers of Christianity and such. So here we see also an old man retreating into the wilderness. But again, the difference here is that the hermit is being guided by something inside. Usually we see where the hermit is retreating, getting inner wisdom and maybe guiding some others, serving as their inner torch, as it were, that he's carrying here. But here it's a different approach. It's turned uh, in an opposite direction where the presence is the one that is guiding him he is not sure why he is following this path but something is demanding from him satisfaction that he would only get by recognizing acknowledging that voice understanding what it wants and following its demands and then maybe in the cave in the darkness being able to reunite with his inner guidance and receive it so again uh, the, the final goal would be similar in both cards, but the way to get there is represented in slightly different terms because the Hermit does not often have a guiding figure uh, that we can see. It's too intangible usually. And then we have Wheel of Fortune. It is always driven by several opposing forces and sometimes fantastical creatures in standard decks. And this is no exception. It is uh, set in balance by the conflict and cohabitation of two opposing, possibly, but complementary forces. It's the yin and yang balance. You go one way, you go up, you go down. The odds are in your favor, then they're not. Uh, and it all evens out. It's the ultimate balance where you can control something and something controls you, etc, etc. So, in this case, there is nobody specifically guided by the presence, and for that reason, this card is more typical of the Major Arcana than others that we have seen. Then we have Strength. This is an interesting choice. There are sometimes dogs in the strength card, sometimes other creatures, but usually it is reserved for a lion or at least some feline, uh, maybe sometimes a big cat, sometimes a black panther. The black dog is a somewhat unusual choice in my experience, but it serves just as well. The idea is always the same, that power and strength relationship, where this, the lesser seemingly part, the one that seems to need the help of the other, is the one that's actual power, because it provides the guidance for where the brutal strength, the application of talents is required, and it is this massive dog that seems so dominant on one hand, it's the one that needs the guidance. Without the guidance of this gentleman over here, the dog would be lost. And that is true for most of the strength cards, there's that relationship where the seemingly weaker is the one guiding the stronger, and the stronger is the one that needs the strength actually from the one who is weaker. And the hangman is uh, fairly similar to others, where the person is hanging upside down to get a different perspective on what needs to be done and what is to come. Uh, there are several choices for the hangman. Some of them are tying the noose around their own neck and holding it, possibly in imitation of what Odin did on the tree Yggdrasil when he was hanging himself to obtain wisdom, a willing sacrifice, if you will. And others are tied uh, involuntarily and against their will. So this shows two different representations of the hangman in most decks. Either they're forced to see the perspective or they accept the need to see the perspective. Sometimes they have difficulties with making the right steps towards accepting the perspective, towards seeing it. Sometimes they're willing to make the right steps but unable to do it correctly without hurting themselves. So there are all kinds of emotional elements in all of the hangman cards and this one is surely no exception. And then we have Death, Lady Death here with the size, that's uh, typical of uh, several medieval representations of Death. And the main difference of this deck is that 
the Lady Death is turning away here from the combatants below and is impartial to their plight. So, there are different outlooks on this. Some decks make her involved and familiar with whoever's life she's taking, but in this case, it's almost like those two combatants are taking themselves out by fighting each other. So, in this case, it is the conflict that brings, uh, in a sense, self destruction. And it is a nice depiction. Death looks dominating, death looks powerful. So, it is tempting to think that she is really determined the outcome and that was the view of many medieval philosophers about what happens during death but here we see that the card shows that actually it is this choice to fight each other that brings it about so again the relationship the subtle reversal is very typical for this deck terror of the spirit world temperance here is pretty typical. All, most of the temperance cards are designed after several images that were popular in medieval iconology and it's the idea of mixing water and wine of course and how they're not supposed to mix. Uh, in the case of this deck it would be again something similar to logic and emotions trying to mix. Possibly similar to how Jekyll and Hyde cannot coexist at the same time because they serve somewhat opposing directions according to popular depictions at least. A very interesting and unique approach for the Devil card. Uh, here in most cases the Devil is an actual outside force to a degree. Um, many times it represents addictions. In this case, uh, the representation of the devil is done slightly differently. Instead of the two people in chains, here there is only one, but that sometimes happens. The more interesting part is that the devil is directed outward, where the one experiencing its effects is directed in a sense inward and is looking pointedly down here towards something red. It's not accidental that the red here possibly representing blood and desire is also the color that's showing up in the depiction of the devil. Such symbolic nuances allow beautiful interpretations. And the devil is also some kind of a mirror. Over here you can see the mirror frame in a sense where the person is tying themselves up to some kind of perhaps false self-image. It is that slavery to illusion, slavery to addiction, slavery to habits. It's done slightly differently, but again the devil is less supernatural here than in many other decks and more psychological, the kind of inner demon that would be more apt to describe it here. And here we have this headless horseman pretty much, or in this case headless knight. That is a slightly different depiction for the tower, but it still conveys the relationship of what the tower represents, where you are trying to do something, you aspire towards something and your foundations are not firm enough, so that something without the foundations collapses. And the head of the knight here represents the concept the body, the idea, and how they are set apart. They are not connected appropriately and for that reason the head is eventually taken out. Just like in many other decks, the tower itself or at least its upper parts are destroyed. The upper part always represents that main kernel that did not properly materialize, did not mature, so that's why if it, the tower card comes about different projects that started, they would not end necessarily well because there is not enough attention to detail, not enough practical element, not enough implementation of the concept represented by a head or by the top of the tower normally. This is a slightly different approach, but just to strike into my mind. Uh, the stars appear to be more familiar. The color scheme could have been a little brighter. It usually is in most decks, but the concept is still the same, that aspiration for the guidance, the higher guidance. Uh, many people liken the star to the star of Bethlehem that was guiding towards uh, Jesus and such if you believe in Christianity, but that was how 
many medieval theologists believed in, so that's why it is still a relevant image even for many of us who don't. And the lady is very typical here. Uh, the moon shows an interesting uh, deviation here. There is a reflection that is not always pursued on the moon cards. Uh, so it is the reflection of the instinct, how it affects the outside world to a degree. It's that mirror reflection that shows here is what I intend and here is how it comes across, for example. That would be one possible interpretation of this visual image. So the sun card is playing with a very interesting interplay here. And that is where there is the regular rider that we see on other sun cards and at the same time there's also somebody hiding seemingly which is conspicuously absent on the regular sun card and that makes it another special twist uh, hiding from the sun could imply hiding from the activity of the ego um, trying to do something instinctively guided by feelings rather than rationale that is represented by the sun in this instance for example so uh, it is a slightly different interpretation visually artistically of the sun that exists in other decks the judgment has been played many different ways uh, usually it's some kind of a version of angel gabriel calling people to the last judgment and they're rising from the dead and different decks play depending on their theme with that motif some of them have the dead remaining the dead instead of rising in their skeletal form some of them turn to monsters there are all kinds of since there's so many decks very many interpretations and this one does not seem to be standing out much only it uh, this figure of the angel here is reminiscent in part of the lovers card that we've seen where the angel is also presiding over the lovers so they ha share certain facial attributes and color scheme and also the trumpet as has been done before is here twisted a little bit and that is also normal enough it's not a major deviation because some decks do that where for some reason the trumpet turns on itself so uh, in most respects it's very similar to the original as you can tell and now to the minor arcana it seems that of all the elements uh, of the four suits pentacles appears to be the more related to the traditional system it follows the material implementation of the other elements as is common and it doesn't have any subtle influences it doesn't have too many deviations uh, the main difference is that it tells a more elaborate story than the regular pentacle in the rider weight system and this is not completely uncommon it does happen in several decks that are well depicted artistically they try not to skimp on the details and instead of just the regular number of pentacles like here you would see for example uh, 10 pentacles and nothing else in many decks this one just tells you a story and that is appropriate a point of interest is how the element of wands is implemented the queen of wands stand out as she should but she follows a particular pattern that might remind you of something else we've seen in the major arcana and that is the uh, high priestess card and that was when there was an interaction between two parts as it were the lower and the higher to a degree even though that is not a common feature of every deck at all and it would not suit uh, the Rider way deck necessarily it has other correspondences but here the high priestess can be taken as a partial uh, protector as the guiding power behind this element of wands because of this connection and it is such connections that determine which major arcana truly governs the particular suit or parts of a particular suit but uh, aside from the queen that gave us this hint 
There are also very interesting connections here. Uh, the ones element throughout has the most supernatural elements of any other. So with that in mind, it is also tied up to the devil card we've seen earlier where the devil appears to be in the Hierophant, where there are two supernatural, vivid supernatural influences. So the three of them could be even core rulers. Again, none of this is common. It is just visual correspondences of this specific deck and peculiar to it. So it's very interesting. And you can see that it's consistent. Here we have a devil figure. Uh, this kind of a demon, again, could remind you of how the demon was positioned in the devil card. Uh, there are some differences because here there is a close interaction. Uh, the devil uh, part and the human part are in closer union than they were before. Uh, in the devil card, one of them, the human, was directed inward and the devil was directed outward. It's almost like the introvert and the uh, extrovert combined psychologically. Here, there is more of a cooperation, but still there is some distance because the girl is looking in a direction that is not fully the devil but somewhere else so there's still some element of cooperation and some of distance but because it is very similar to the other card we have seen the devil the devil will be inspiring the readings in this element as well and here there is another supernatural entity and of course, with that in mind, it would be very different from many other two of ones in any other deck, because you would not find many like this one. Uh, how to analyze it is based on how the major arcana works, where there was that red in the devil card and the girl looking at the mirror where there was blood similar to the devil's colors. So this is the red of passion of unbridled desire, desire that is not mad, that might be getting out of control, especially if the card is in reverse position, and there is no subtler influence that's too obvious that's controlling it, which means that the logic and the emotion are not fully in accord, and that's represented by this delightful beast that is probably out of control, just like passions can be desires, emotions. And here we have another of the same element, a demonic looking figure. Uh, there is still a tribute to the element as you can see in the background. That's how the element is usually portrayed with the number of appropriate ones. Uh, so this is a suitable card in general based on its background. The particulars are unique to this deck. And of course this one is another charming one. Uh, this position is reminiscent of the bent position of the card of Temperance. And for that reason there will be interplay between this card and Temperance. This figure could represent possibly the passion that is arising. And the bent stoop position here to counterbalance it would represent some kind of restraint over it, a logical restraint, a higher understanding of sorts. So it's again a very interesting application and those just a few representatives of this element. The Ace of Wands also follows a similar pattern that's delightful. Here we have a sort of one of those idols that could maybe be like of the Aztec variety and then to counterbalance it there to normal influences just uh, to show possibly balance or contradiction and then we also have those chalices that also follow a pattern of their own virtually chalices we expect of course something to do either cups or, uh, by themselves or water or some relation to water and here if anything we see tracks on the ground. That is not at all a usual conventional way of representing it, but the site itself looks so glorious that it definitely makes up for it. And yet, how would we interpret it then, if it's different? Well, it's possibly the traces that emotion leaves in its wake. It is how 
to trace it back to its source in a sense if uh, somebody is wondering how a particular thought came to them then this would be tracking it back symbolically and for that reason the element of chalices just like wands is also not entirely consistent with the overall system and then we have swords uh, the swords here is somewhat consistent in concept with the regular element of swords where there is a conflict and here the main difference is how the concept is implemented we see that the two parts the higher part represented by the wings here and the lower part the body they are not necessarily compatible they are in opposition with each other and that is appropriate for sword sword often represents various kinds of conflict again between logic and emotion or between two different ideas or between two desires it has all kinds of it has been implemented in infinite amount of ways so this is not necessarily out of the norm completely it's just this particular application again that is faithful to how the major arcanum was with all the subtle influences here the subtle influence is deeply ingrained inside and it's trying to battle over dominion with the other part that is generally in the major arcana would be separate from it and more tangible so it's a very interesting touch here and then again contrasted with pentacles that is fairly simple here the concept that this person is having is being realized on the painting that he is drawing so he is implementing something into practical form just the way Pentacles, something you would expect from Pentacles, where something abstract is realized in material terms, terms that you can touch, understand, see, feel the effect of. So here, for that reason, I conclude that the Pentacle is the more likely of the elements to be the most consistent with the Rider weight deck. And now we can go back and check all the other cards in this deck with all of those ideas in mind and those cards are very different each one has to be analyzed based on the consistency of this deck but they're all really pretty and intelligible in their own right once we understand that we have to judge them in a different way not in the way that would be normally assigned to such cards in this element Here we have another application of this reciprocal relationship that we have seen between the young and the old, the gaining experience, the receiving experience. It's a very fascinating engagement and it keeps repeating even throughout elements, especially with kings and queens. And here we have an interesting aspect of the number four. Normally some of those numbers are divided into an even such as three and one. Uh, five and two and such but here it's an even number and that seems uh, awfully appropriate and symmetrical and here it's not coincidental that the color of this thing is red so the person involved here will probably be battling against his desires represented by this color Here we see that the colors shown are of two different shades. So here we'll have some kind of synthetic approach, the attempt to reconcile two opposing spectrums. Sometimes there are different decks, they're also portrayed in red and blue. The color scheme changes, it's not always this one, but you can usually tell a difference. And the ultimate expression of the sword element in a sense where there is the expression of emotion that in sword element takes uh, the form of aggression of violent self-expression of extreme self-expression of conflict all of those are present in the positioning of the hand holding the dagger of the mouth open all of those factors will be very important for good reading
And when interpreting this, it will be interesting to play on the contrast of the two people's heights and of the fact that this figure is balancing this row and this one does not have it. So one of them would probably play the role of the strength card that we've seen before where this would be the power because it's the more subtle, the less tangible and this would be the strength that needs the guidance of this one. Another charming monster and again it would be similar where there is the intangible influence throughout the deck and then somebody is getting inspired by it. It seems like an older man, it seems like he would be following the voice of an experience and maybe this figure represents the practical experience that this person has gained. And similar case here, where the one that is about to speak will be influenced by the one who is silent. There's always this kind of interplay between the active, the passive, the dominant, the inspired, all kinds of different balancing acts. Very, very nice for this deck. And again, the position of receiving and the position of giving the main difference here that there is also that agency presiding over it that would remind us of the angel from before that was presiding over the lovers. This one would have some elements common to the lovers despite the different numerological significance, but they could come up together in uh, a reading once in a while. This and, and lovers and the other cards that are affected by lovers from Minor Arcana. This kind of a book we could normally anticipate possibly from the High Priestess, but instead it is this that serves as the inspiration for the knowledge. But the High Priestess could still come into play with this card as well, it, they could share certain similarities of concept. This one, despite being a different kind of a mount, could still serve as a counterpoint to the chariot card when relevant. Because it is also in motion, in balance, there's activity, there's where, what is the right way to move and such. So all of these ideas would be common with the chariot. Very charming sights overall, each card is its own painting, it's definitely well done, it's inspiring. It's different, but all the more striking because of that. And this one has certain similarities with the fool from earlier, who was drawn to something and guided by something and trying to experiment without understanding the risks and this one seems to be the natural conclusion of this process where the fool is following his path to the fullest.
this is a nice card that sort of reminds me of what the magician could have been in many other applications but here it plays an entirely different role i suppose the person here is not controlling the elements so much as possibly experiencing them indirectly because of the agency of this influence so this has been the minor arcana here is how the back of the card looks it is vaguely reminiscent in its darker outline of the star card and I suppose it could have been brighter it would have been easier to see the back is not completely as striking as the front but it doesn't detract really from the message because who's really going to look at the back while reading the cards so uh, I think it was well implemented and here are a few additional cards that come with it. One of them says the name in several different languages. And the other one is an interesting one because it has a list of different air decks available from the same company. One of them was interesting, it was the Olympus deck. I don't know if I would try it or not, but the name itself sounds inviting because I'm into mythology. As many of you would know if you watched me. And here is the box from the car. You can see Terror of the Spirit World in here. And this picture of the High Priestess on the front cover. Here is the back of the box. So this has been Terror of the Spirit World by Beppe Vigna. I also have a dream deck by him that taught me initially how to interpret dreams really well and part of it gave me so many ideas, so I really enjoyed it. And I hope you enjoyed this review. This has been Gomez of the Jekyll Hyde Club with the Terror of the Spirit World. Thanks to Curious Cat for asking for this review. And I have a whole playlist dedicated to Terror called Terror Studies with Gomez. If you would like, check it out.